Everything's being recorded. Right. Okay. okay, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we, we are all meeting today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And thank you all for joining us. Um, I don't know, I'm a little bit over Zoom meetings, but once I started, you know, we got into planning this, it was getting quite exciting. So I hope you have a good day. Um, everything will be recorded until general business and general business will be an open and free discussion that won't be recorded because it worked quite well last year. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Elizabeth Humphreys. Dr. Elizabeth Humphreys is a senior lecturer in social and political science program at UTS. Um, she's a political economist interested in the impact of crisis and change on workers. And her recent, her current research includes the impact of climate change on workers, the 1970 Westgate Bridge disaster, and the impact of neoliberalism on Australian unions and labour. The session this morning is going to be slightly different in that we've got questions that we're going to ask Elizabeth about research and using archives and local studies collections. So the questions. Um, I'll read out the questions. I will read them out from the piece of paper. Elizabeth will address them. And then if you've got any other questions, feel free to ask. So, um, Elizabeth, first question, and I'm sorry I have to read this. In the podcast Archive Fever with historians Eves Rees, Reese and Claire Wright, they asked guests when the archive bug hit them with some really interesting responses. So when was that for you and what archive did you first visit? Yeah, I've been listening to Archive Fever over the last few weeks. Um, I, um, I know both those historians from Twitter, but I hadn't, hadn't listened to the podcast. So I've been thinking about this as I've... Um, as I've kind of been um, hearing other people's stories. And I think it's really two things. The first time I went to an archive was during my PhD when I went to the Butlin Archive in, at ANU in Canberra. And as I understand it, your next speaker is from the Butlin ANU archive. Um, but it just occurred to me this morning, there was something else that happened. In, in the year 2000, I was in Melbourne, which is where I grew up. I've just lived in Sydney for a long time. And I went to a talk by a woman called Joan Nessel, who was a working class Jewish um, lesbian woman who set up the Lesbian Her Story Archives in New York, which was um, really a collection of started off by activists and she gave even though it was the year 2000 she gave a slideshow about um about that archive and what the community had collected over time and I remember thinking oh yes if you're this was long before my PhD if you're an activist in a social movement you do collect all these materials and um can start to I guess keep the history of your own movement and it struck me as a social movement activist then that a lot of people had individual materials but a lot of the history of at that time it was the global justice movement there had been the big protests around crown casino for the world economic forum that most of and a lot of that history would have been lost except for the fact that the state library of victoria had um, collected materials as those movements uh, and ephemera as those movements were sort of um, playing out and i guess it struck me that there is these or can be these in, interesting collaborations between academics, people who manage collections and libraries and ordinary people who are, you know, creating history um, sort of in that moment so that future generations of scholars and interested parties can, um, can look at those materials. And so it means like, of course, when I think about going to the Butlin, you're enormously grateful for um, the union staff and archivists and probably just random individuals in those unions who collected materials over time, not just official minutes books, but the, the like the, the, the ephemera and the more messy stuff of history that doesn't make it into the minutes of meetings. 
And then, of course, obviously, the enormous effort from the Butlin to put together that incredible um, resource. The reason I even knew about the Butlin is because um, one of my friends had been the archivist at, um, at the Butlin, Butlin archive and was involved in the campaign to retain the Butlin when ANU looked to close it. So I've also, that really, that um, first time, because I'm not a historian, I'm a political economist, so you're not always um, going to be looking to archives. I had really relied on interviews as my main method, but, you know, God, I love those first weeks in the Butlin, having that dedicated space, um, staff to assist you, resources, you know, and you're immer immersed like you're trying to make every moment. So you probably know when people come have to travel to go to look at materials every second that the library's open, you're at that desk madly trying to go through materials. But, like, I absolutely loved that first visit to the Butlin. That's great. Um, you have used a range of archives and collections across several states and territories. Can you tell us a bit about the various collections you have used? Well, yeah, it's... um Because obviously when it... Like, look, I went to the Butler mainly to look at the um, Amalgamated Metal Workers Union's records, but the national union's records are there. The state, there were state materials in the Melbourne Uni archives. So I also went off to Melbourne Uni, which is where I originally studied, um, and looked at the Victorian Trades Hall Council records there. And I looked at the ACTU records to do with the accord um, at the Butlin as well. But doing, um, many of you probably know that um, the Westgate Bridge collapsed during construction in Melbourne in 1970, so 51 years ago now, and 35 workers were killed. So one of the projects I have, I grew up not far from that, um, that bridge in working class Western Melbourne. Um, Sarah Gregson from UNSW and I have had a project for a few years looking at it started off just about the memorialization of um, that um, that event, but it quickly we're still not written our paper on the memorialization, um, but we've written other papers like relooking at the royal commission findings um, about the bridge and trying to reassess them, I guess, with a different take that you have fifty years later to what they had in the immediate aftermath, and so that required going to. Uh, the National Archives in Canberra, and Sarah did that. We both went initially to the Public Records Office um, of Victoria in North Melbourne, um, and we've had our own um, our own libraries have held, held certain materials, luckily, like um, the full transcripts of the Royal Commission just happened to be at UNSW's library, which was really helpful because we couldn't obviously, it's like, 15 volumes this big, like we couldn't get through it when at PROV in our first visit. We've also gone to the Melbourne Uni archives again to look at the records from the social workers who visited the families of the um, people who died. Um, and just thinking like, we've tried to go anywhere and everywhere. Um, and even like materials that people have held. Um, there was one guy who was, um, a journalist um, who had done um, was sort of on the side a thing for the 20th anniversary for 3CR, the community radio station, a bit like 2SER in New South Wales, and had done these interviews with survivors and other key people. And he had the original tapes off in, you know, Castle Maine in country. Victoria and so we've worked with him to digitize those um, and um, now we're looking for a home for those um, so we're sort of the pandemic has made the originals are stuck in Sydney um, <laughs> in Sarah's office which she hasn't been to for 18 months I'm so sorry I'm just super distracted because <laughs> it's just trying to jump on me um that's what we like <laughs> i'm always up for cat content on zoom if anyone's got a cat to show me um and yeah so like i've also tried to think about what 
we do with our materials um, about the Westgate and even just this, this invite um, today to talk has had me think, well, maybe we, obviously the State Library of Victoria is one obvious place to put these materials, but maybe actually we should talk to Hobson Bay Library in Williamstown, which is like, might be nice for some of these materials to be within a kilometre of the site where, um, where the men died. So, you know, sometimes I think it's difficult to know who's got the resources. Um, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is not answering your question, but who's got the resources to take on your materials, um, to clear the materials? Like, I guess one thing with um, these interviews is excerpts were in the public radio program, but not the full interviews. And then there are ethical issues about can these interviews where consent wasn't Consent was gotten for the interviews at the time, but consent wasn't gotten to deposit them in a library or in a collection, then who might have capacity and resources to even take on the clearing of consent from those people or their families? And um, that probably speaks to some of the issues, I guess, you deal with day to day about um, resourcing of um, materials in libraries. But it's certainly, you know, it's always on the mind of... Um, of people like myself, you know, the, the reason the button was threatened is not because people don't think records are important, but because it costs money and universities and other public institutions are always um, short. Yeah. In, in using these resources in the various institutions, were there any that you didn't have access to or you couldn't access for various legal or privacy issues or was everything out there? Um, no, I think with the Westgate, the majority of materials are not in public collections. They're held by families and um, the people involved, the victims and the survivors and the people who came to be on the memorial committee afterwards and others who have in various ways been involved in, I guess, the legacy of that. Um, so... Definitely every time we've spoken to someone, they say, oh, I've got X, Y, and Z. Um, our ethics clearance was only to interview um, people who were actively involved in the memorialisation. So people right. who were already used to and currently engaged in talking about the disaster in public, right? And that was partly about not wanting to make a difficult thing worse for any family members. So we, you know, ethic, the ethics was easier to get because these people were already publicly talking about the disaster and its impacts. Not that there's no emotional impact for them, like it's 50 years, but I can tell you some of the survivors, you know, like you never, you never get over something like that. But what we didn't do, I can see the possibility of this, but it comes down to, I guess, again, the resources that um, academics have, a public call out for materials um, would be the way to go. I've been thinking about my colleague, um, Alana, who has a criminology project where the public help with transcriptions of early wow. um, legal records. I think wow. it's through PROV um, in Victoria again like some kind of crowdsourced collaborative thing would work. But even then, even just the time to set up that and find an institution willing to collect those materials, even if they're digitised, somebody has to check every single one before they go in the collection and make a decision <laughs> about it. Those resourcing issues are big. Um, there are also those social worker records. We had to be very careful because, you know, we had permission from the from the modern day service that inherited the the care of those records um, but they're records that pertain to um, people's private lives and children and others who were mentioned the records would still be alive so you know I guess we didn't think Sarah didn't think because she looked at those records that she would encounter things that we're on the edge of what our ethics covered. So she, we have to be quite assiduous about not, sometimes you have to not look 
at records. You've got permission to see something that when you get to those records, they might um, include other things. And I certainly had that at the Butlin as well. I, there were um, cabinet papers that were um, definitely not cleared yet time-wise about the accord. And there was obviously they'd been shared with the union and then the union had put them in its records and then the records had been put in the archives. And I was kind of like, no, I'd love to look at these, but maybe I shouldn't. And in the end, I just gave them to the archivist at the Butler and I just thought it's not, um, you know, I feel uncomfortable about looking and my PhD is not going to make or break on um, yeah. a secret thing. Like for me, um, I was taking a new set of questions to look at old materials and facts. I wasn't expecting to uncover something, something like, I don't know, the Queen's letters, uh, the palace letters right to Kerr or something. Um, and so I think a lot of the time, even records that have been looked at a number of times, I imagine those records about the Accord and the AMW have been looked over. Sometimes you're just taking a new set of questions because history is not just about those collection of facts, but what, what do we think today of those, um, uh, of those events and how might we have a different take? Same with the question of memorialization. Like the key thing for us, we just keep, ha we have to wait for the 50th anniversary celebrations and COVID has canceled them twice. So one, we can't really finish that paper about memorialization. But one thing is like memorials, like the one with the Westgate are like a plaque on the bridge. In other countries, memorials sometimes get moved or taken down. It's harder because that one's on the bridge, but, you know, society changes and its take even on a disaster like that gets reinterpreted and reimagined. And I guess that's one thing we've been thinking about how, and that's where archives and collections come in, how did people understand that memorialisation when that memorial was set up? And then what, what's the meaning today, um, 50 years later, and how has it changed over those time, yeah. that time? Now that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, oh, okay. So the other next question, you've been doing some research about fairly recent industrial history as part of your Hertzberg Fellowship at the State Library and your Westgate project research. Oh, we've already sort of covered that, haven't we? Because we've, what are some of the resources you've been using for this? So oh, okay. you've sort of covered that, but, um, but it does help us as public librarians think about how we collect and what we would collect. Um, so that's sort of being covered. Just on that, like obviously I've been conscious that most of the collections I've used are not um, public library collections. Right. But I had really, I guess, um, kind of jumps back to your question. I would have dearly loved Hobson Bay Library <laughs> to have a collection about the Westgate. Yeah. I think the lo I know from growing up in Melbourne's West that your relationship to that disaster and its impact is very different to those who live on the other side of the city, some of whom I've met academics who've lived in Melbourne, born there their whole life and have, have never heard about the Westgate disaster. You, could, you, you just couldn't have grown up in Melbourne's West. Like everybody knows where they were when the bridge came down. People heard it at local primary schools. People knew families whose parent, whose dad was um, killed or injured. And so I think, I think it, although that is the largest um, disaster in construction in Australian history and probably the outside mining, the largest disaster ever. Yeah. Um, you, there's a very specific local component to, to that. And, you know, if I, I don't know, maybe when I retire, <laughs> that's sort of the project you think, well, could you play a, a useful role in helping collect materials, not for my own purposes, but yeah. um, for, for scholars in the future and just just members of the public like I you know I think history isn't just for scholars right it's also for people who are just interested that's right they do their own family histories but sometimes they're just fascinated about a particular event and want to um 
use those materials. And like I said about that talk from Joe Nessel, my first excitement about an archive was just like in seeing somebody seeing a particular need of a particular section of the community that was not well represented in official public collections and up springs, um, springs that collection. Similar here for um, the Pride Centre's collection in New South Wales, but also like the um, now called Queer Archives um, in Melbourne, like what a magnificent community um, initiative that is. And I, so I think, you know, public libraries can, I think, all really play a part in, um, it's not just things that say the State Library of Victoria wouldn't collect. I think actually different things would be collected by a local library. Yeah. That, that, my, that would be my thoughts. Um, yeah. And we do, we do collect different things. We collect things specific to a community and the local community. And we try to provide as much information and resources and ephemera that we can so that people down the track like you can come in and research an incident. And it just made me think of the Granville train disaster in Sydney. I'm just wondering now if the library in Granville has been collecting stuff or has people's stories, because again, that's another story that that Donna. It's Donna. Yes, yes. It's Jane here from Cumberland, yes. and yes. Granville's in our area. Um, the issue with Granville is that it is a branch library, and right. it was with Parramatta Library back when the Granville train disaster yes. happened. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, so although there are some resources in the library, there aren't a lot relating right, to the right. Granville train disaster. So Parramatta had, didn't actively collect, collect anything. Well, they might have done within, that would, would be at the main Parramatta right, library, right, not here. Right. In fact, yeah. Anir is on, she might be able to add something to that. But yeah, as I, I said, now since the amalgamation, it's part of our library service. So we have some materials relating to the disaster, but not a huge amount. Mm. Yeah. No, yeah, no, we, we did, we have some books and some other stuff and a couple of oral history stories, but a Granville Historical Society was very active at that time. Yeah, right. And they have heaps of information. Um, and yeah, they, they were the base, basically custodian and, and they have published a book as well, uh, yes, which they have given, right. like they we assisted the them. Yeah, yeah. so. Yep. Yeah, what Mary says is interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes it's that materials are in a few places and um, what it take, might take is a small grant and a willing archivist or researcher or academic to help sort of bring together something or even just to weave together a one-stop shop yeah, for the resources yeah. that are there. And that's what I like about the Butlin, like all that work in trying to track down where union materials are all around the country and all different types of libraries so that it helps a researcher like myself, not only, you know, even because unions change their names and, you know, that such enormous work into getting that trade union collection visible, right? right. And and documented in a way that people then can go and access it. Like, um, and with, you know, I, I'm in a group called the, like the old Western suburbs of Melbourne. I think the Facebook group is called, but I can tell you the number of people who every, there's so much content in there. People miss that the Westgate's talked about every few months, right? Oh, wow. But every time someone puts up a thread, somebody else tells another different story about where they were or something to do with their family or their dad who worked on some part the day before, plus like photographs and um, things like that. And you can see the possibilities between that, between the Williamstown Historical Society, like Nira says, who played a similar role, it sounds like, to the Granville Historical Society, collecting stuff and then you've got families and survivors and yeah. so that's why like I was thinking in those situations a project that kind of brings together who's got what and then a portal where members of the public can say this is what I've got and here's a digitized version of what I've got even or donating it um, and like I see Jeff says in the discussion that's all for so for descendants of course right of course um, Sarah and I helped a little bit with um the documentary that Shane Jacobson, the actor and comedian, did about the Westgate two years ago, like in providing all our materials, and then Sarah was interviewed. 
you know, you can see how meaningful it is to have that public telling of the story of the descendants in that, that film as well. It's not always scholarly work that needs to draw on those materials. It's like him and his, um, yeah. like his sort of chief of staff who did the research for that documentary. And again, it's just, for him, it was a feeling that a story needed to be told. How were they gonna collect the information in order to do it well? Mm. Um, yeah, so I think there's that, that other role for like providing materials for cultural in institutions. Um, yeah. Important. Okay, so working in archives is often a mix of the deadly dull and the unexpected. Can you tell us about the most mem memorable moments you've had? <sighs> I don't know if it is deadly dull, but I have to say, I worked for the New South Wales Ombudsman before I was an academic. And so we would go and do inspections of prison records and um, like, you know, juvenile justice records for people who are on high risk. You know, you're looking to check that somebody's gone and checked on them every t five minutes or 10 minutes. You know, so I've definitely looked through dull records in my life, but... Um, one skill I learned at the Ombudsman was how do you look through a large volume of material quickly, right? Because you can't spend days at every jail checking and auditing. Um, and it really helped me when I became an academic because I'm super fast, right, at looking through records. And if you're travelling, it's expensive and um, was a good skill. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, um, God, I think the most memorable thing that happened was at the Public Records Office in Victoria. Sarah and I took a trip to Melbourne and um, we had, I think we had 10 days. Um, and we knew the transcripts of the Royal Commission were there. And so Sarah took that job and I took the job of looking at all the, uh, any other record I could find. And I could see some online and there were um, body cards, which I, like, hadn't seen a body card from the coroner's office before, but it's like a little fold-out, um, like, thick cardboard where they're recording basic facts of, uh, which includes who, where the person lived, how old they were, um, uh, the who came to collect the body, um, who was the um, funeral directors, and... You know, like it was, you know, so they didn't tell you much, but what they did tell you is there was this class map of Melbourne, right, that emerged from these addresses of who was killed and who who collected the bodies. You know, there were three engineers out of 35 and they lived in the eastern wealthy suburbs and then there were 32 um, men who lived in working class suburbs and out towards Geelong. But the two incredible sort of things happened. One was... At the end of the day, I could see that I was then getting through all the photos that the Royal Commission had um, had. There were like a few from the site and other things, but there was a booklet that I can't even remember what was on the front, but I just knew it was going to be photos of the bodies um, on the inside. And I had to, I really was thinking like, should I look at them or is that voyeuristic to look at them? Um, like, was like a, I don't know, uncomfortable feeling. And like I, so I showed them to Sarah and I said, look, this is going to be X. And she was like, yep. I said, I don't know whether to look at them. And she just sort of nodded and she just looked through them and then she handed them back to me. And I looked through them and I was kind of, they were horrific. Um, but also some of the bodies were so undamaged, right? But you... It's one thing to say a catastrophe has that kind of impact, but it's another thing to, I think, see, see it visually. And I was so glad I looked at them because I think you, I only really understood the weight of that event in seeing the damage. Wow. Uh, it's hard to explain. But also it's one thing to say some of the men were 18 or 19. It's another thing to see the age range, right, um, of the men from old to young. 
and like I still I still think about like what if I'd not looked I would I think I would have had a I would not have had the same relationship to the topic or the research oh, if I hadn't have looked. Yeah. The other thing that was in the files is like when you talk to people about that disaster, they always talk about um, the mud, right? As the as the huge pylon came down, crashing into the wetlands, like it threw mud enormous distances. So there were cars, the work site was covered in mud. The survivors talk about it being freezing cold and they're still searching for bodies in the water and they're covered in mud. And then I open up one of the body cards and there is a little, like it's like a teardrop shape, right? And I've rec I recognise it from the photos that it's the number that they had to put on some people's bodies because they couldn't identify them and it's still, it's covered in the mud, right? And you just... You just really, I think, sorry, like you just really understand in those moments that these are real people who've died. And I think you have this enormous responsibility to, to, um, to the research, um, to do, to do um, those people justice, I guess. Like it's a funny feeling because as an academic, you're meant to be a bit separate and examining the facts and presenting them in a particular way but like gosh you sometimes the records just stay with you yeah. you know yeah. yeah thank you so much for sharing. oh sorry i've just i've never actually said any of that out loud so you kind of like don't realize what an impact it's had on you thank you very much um do you want a moment before i ask you the next question oh no we better probably move on or i'll be <laughs> crying <laughs> Um, okay, so the next question is what sort of tech setup and process do you use when in the archives to ensure good practice? Nice oh, yeah. question. Now, this is a great question to follow up with. Um, <laughs> I think I discovered my process a bit by accident, but there is an important implication, I think, for people running libraries. When I was at the Butlin, I Cameras and phones obviously have come a long way, right, in terms of being able to document materials. And so there were other people in the Butlin who were still using cameras um, and then obviously having to download in individual images and resort them that night. The beeping is annoying, right, in a very quiet library of those cameras. And I think older people don't know how to turn their beeping off on. Their things, but the great thing about camera phones is that there are apps like Cam Scanner or Google, um, Google, can't remember what it's called. Google have have one as well where you can take multiple images and turn them into a PDF on your phone, and so it saves you time in like try, how do you get that in an organized form where you know what you're looking at and you've documented it right so you can cite it later in scholarly research but also um, these apps OCR their images right so you can then text search so what I would do is I would you know a booklet or a meeting minutes might be five pages you have those five pages you turn it into an PDF, it OCRs. If you've got Wi-Fi, I can then directly upload it from my phone in that moment to Evernote, which is the notes program I use, but you can also do it direct to Dropbox. Um, and therefore, you're never worried about losing your material or data. And so for me, even as I upload it, I would then sit at my computer at the Butlin and it would turn up in like a new note in this notes program with the attachment of the PDF and I could rename it like Z162 or whatever the um, AMWU thing is called and I'd be like folder label, blah, blah, blah. So when I came to do the write up the PhD two years later, um, I had notes of super important things I read on the day, but you can't, you can't read everything and there was this highly organised process. So one, it was about like data security and not losing anything that you, um, 
you looked at or you took images of, either because you lost your phone or you lost your camera or... Um, and so that Wi-Fi access was crucial. Now, that first visit to the Butlin, I had to have a friend from ANU, um, a student, lend me their Wi-Fi password, which I, as you would all know, is a big no-no, right? Handing out um, a password to a university system. And it, it really made me think, then I, I think the Butlin have changed that now because the sec I have been back a second time for the Hertzberg project at the State Library just to check over a few things. And I'm pretty sure they had public access then. Most libraries would have public access, but it's a real lesson for universities where they're much more restricted sometimes about who can log on to the Wi-Fi that actually can prevent a visiting researcher from like having good data management practices because you can't access the cloud necessarily on your phone. When we're talking huge, like those sorts of files and photographs are huge size images, um, most people would bust their data limit um, in the space of a week or two visit. Um, so for me that I've seen other people have just terrible tech setups and I've not been able to work out why um, and I worry, I worry they um, they spend all this time later and Sarah, my collaborator, is a bit like that. She doesn't know how to upload photos more than one at a time to Facebook and things like that. So it's a real skill, I think, that um, for scholars and non-scholars who are doing history projects about the sort of tech possibilities to make life easier. Um, yeah, and it's not, I'm not young young but like just being perhaps a generation younger than Sarah means um, those tech things work well and I imagine a lot of people doing family library stuff are Sarah's age in their 60s 70s um, and yeah I don't I thought I never saw anything though sometimes you just want simple advice like yeah. how do you use a zoom machine to actually record an oral history or like how do you actually upload things and store them in a way that's helpful for coming back to them later. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, what do you think makes a good archive or local studies experience for a user? Could you say that again, sorry, Don? What do you think makes a good archive or local studies experience for a user? So it's having Wi-Fi. Yeah, definitely the Wi-Fi access. Um, I've, I've never had a problem at a public library, though, it's worth saying. And I did a lot of my PhD in branches of the City of Sydney right. Library. Um, the space, because um, often you're like, for me, it was computer, um, you know, notes, only pencils in the Butlin, mm. um, boxes. You've got a trolley with boxes, and I, it's a real blessing at the Butlin or at the State Library of New South Wales, my God, like that reading room, um, yeah. incredible. Um, so I think, yeah, that sort of space to actually um, uh, do things. I think, and someone to ask questions to, like I think, Right. This is more true of the State Library, but I understand why this is, but their catalogue is really confusing. Um, and I wouldn't say I'm in, my brain works well with catalogues. Um, and so it's a bit of effort for me often to work out, even at the Butlin, like how are these, how is this system working, right? So that I know how to go and search. And the, <laughs> the Definitely the State Library staff had to really hold my hand for a while to search through the layers of their, their catalogue um, to make it work. So, um, you know, you can't, I couldn't have gone through all the records I did at either place without that kind of advice, even on, either on the spot or, like I said, with the Butler and those documents that, tell you where everything is, where you can you can actually click through the layers of the union under different names and different years and then it'll tell you where 
stuff is that um yeah and not everybody's brains work the same yeah. right so i think sometimes what can be really plain to librarians about how a catalog works are just absolutely obtuse um and that was my experience at the state library well i must admit i've had trouble with the state library's catalog so it's everyone has problems <laughs> I think it's it's interpreting or assessing or finding um so just one last question what is your favorite collection that you've used oh my god isn't that a bad question um, <laughs> so... <laughs> it doesn't have to be because it's fantastic but maybe because it provided you with the most information or was was the most useful it's a hard question yeah Look, I think my favourite place to look through materials is definitely the State Library. But it's also when I went, launched on that Hertzberg project, it appeared from the catalogue there was going to be mater materials to answer my question. And it turned out that it was more difficult than that and mm -hmm. that there weren't, weren't the sort of materials I expected. That was no one's fault. It's just like sometimes that's the nature of yeah. research. Yeah. So I have a very... I feel I have a fraught relationship with that collection. I love that Mitchell reading room. Like you just, how can you dislike going to work on days that you go into that library and research and the staff are just like yeah. so fantastic at that library. Staff are great. But I've, I really struggled. It wasn't like my other projects where the materials were just there and right. you found yeah. them. And so, um, you know, I had planned to work you know we got ethics approval through the state library and uts for an oral histories project to add interviews about with metal workers to their collection to sort of help help answer my project but others but been two years of covid delaying that now and i feel like you know i've got other i've already i've got a full-time job that doesn't let me jump back in time yeah. to do work that was taken by COVID. It's a bit of a dilemma about how to now uh, progress with adding materials to that collection, um, you know, when my bosses are telling me to do other things. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this, Elizabeth. It's been, it's been great. But does anyone else have some questions for Elizabeth? We've got a bit of time. <laughs> Ellen's saying, I know our catalogue is different. It's... It's not just that, like, literally a question of, like, how people's brains work sometimes. And so I often feel like it, mine works so well with certain things, um, like recording my materials and knowing how to access things because I can adjust that system entirely to how I think about things. But sometimes I encounter catalogues or um, policy policies at uni where like the way that they're set out just doesn't work it's it's always good to realize that you don't think like others because it helps us all do our jobs better in trying to communicate things in ways that are accessible. Yeah. any questions from anyone any uh, yes um donna this is um angela from ride library i have a question um when you see the the level of grief and the need for memorialisation that has happened as a result of the Westgate Bridge disaster, do you then think about memorialisation and grief after something like the First World War? As do you, do you now have a different perception of how the population would have coped after the First World War? Um. Yes and no, right? Like, I think we all have that abstract, more abstract realisation about how horrific war is. And you can, we all hear through the news or life facts and figures, how many people are injured, how, what the level of depression and post-traumatic stress disorders are after those events. But I think that it's something quite different if you're, say, an oral historian and then you're going and doing interviews with survivors and families. And I think the thing about seeing the photos in the archive was 
Well, one, to remember that all of us have to deal with sensitive material, right, and that risks are not just about the people you interview but also to yourself, right, and managing or just being prepared. Like it's not about not doing those things um, or finding ways to process them. But So I feel like there was something qualitatively different between knowing the story and then being much more directly exposed Another very curious thing happened, like my mum's best friend was a funeral director and in Williamstown in Melbourne and moved in the 70s to the Sunshine Coast in Queensland where there are again funeral directors. I didn't know that this close family friend um, who, who's still alive um, in his 80s had actually been one of the funeral directors that collected bodies from the site, right? But it just shows you how doing this research, think I have no family connection, talk to my mother about it multiple times, going to the archives. Even the day I saw those images or the day after, I was then at my mum's that night. The phone rings, I pick it up. It's this woman, Jeanette, from Queensland. And I say, she says, what are you doing there? I said, I'm doing this. And she said, well, you know, John went and collected the bodies when he would have been about 20, working with her father. Um, and I, I thought for a while after, would I interview him, right, about going to the site? And I decided no on that occasion, right? Didn't have the, didn't fit the ethics, but also probably unnecessary for the research, maybe traumatic for him. And probably, you know, I was feeling a bit like, you know, you've got to manage your own situation. And so, like, after seeing those photos, I wasn't upset. I was more just... I think like it's just this level of realization about the impact of a historical event that still reverberates through time, right? And so it was like, no, actually, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk to him about it. I'll just sort of leave it there. He, you know, if he wants to talk to me, he can. I think that I think about when I, I did some oral history history training with the, you know, New South Wales Association, and the presenter had done a lot of interviews about. Um, the sec first and second world war, I think. Um, but then again, I just I can hear what he said, but it's totally different when you hear it from somebody directly. I think you have that, and you have an emotional involvement that's different. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Nira said, yeah, it's called Microsoft Lens, yeah. When I was at the State oh, Library, yes. one of the staff actually was like, why are you using this cam scanner thing? Microsoft Lens does the same thing. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. No worries. That was very interesting. And thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks, Donna. My pleasure. Like, you know, it's... um. I love librarians. No, it's true. Um, <laughs> I, you do. Academics couldn't do their jobs, a job like the like mine, with my kind of research, without this layer of professionals. Um, you. If you think about all the places I've said I've been, and all the staff who are involved in um, bringing those collections in and sorting them, it's kind of ma it's kind of mammoth, don't you think? Like that, you have this scholarly article. Um, you know, and I thank those libraries in my book on the Accord, but like it's it seems insufficient when you're like I literally could not have done this research without um, people managing these collections. Oh, that's great! Everyone, thank you, everybody. check out the links that um, Ellen posted for Elizabeth's work. They're very, it's very good. Thank you so much. No worries. See everybody. Thanks thank very much for having me. Bye. Bye. Um. So just waiting for the next speaker. Um, that was great. That was amazing. Sarah is here. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, Sarah is okay. Here. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes? Yep. Should I just start? Oh, sorry, I couldn't see. I've only just seen. Hello. Um, I'd like to introduce Sarah Lethbridge. Lethbridge the senior archivist at the ANU archives, which includes the university archives, the Noel Butlin archives, the Pacific Research archives and National AIDS archives. 
that you've got a lot we have yeah that's amazing in the what just quit in the one building uh three buildings wow. we we could easily do with more we we're almost full we've got um stuff do you have Sorry. Uh, <laughs> six and a half one's part-time okay well thank you for joining us and um i'll hand you over to the audience thank you very much i'll just see if i can share my screen see if i can get this to work um see if I can do yep. it. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm speaking to you from Canberra, the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Nambri people. Um, and I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. And um Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak about our archives. It's a, a wonderful collection. I was pleased that Elizabeth got so much out of it. And I'm aware that our database could be better. Um, so today I'd like to speak to you about some of the records that we have, particularly the archives of business and labor and the records about hotels. Um, we've got, a large collection and you might wonder what is a university doing with all of these records well in the 1950s professor noel butlin an economic historian and his colleagues set about collecting uh, primary source material for their research into 19th century australian economics which was predominantly the pastoral industry so we've got lots of records um, uh, our earliest collection is from the Australian Agricultural Company, which is was very active around Port Stephens and Newcastle. So, yeah, as um, Donna said, there are four collecting streams. Um, we've got uh, about 22,000 shelf readers of records and are still growing, um, overflowing in our space, but we're trying to get some more space. Um, because we never want to say no if we're offered a collection that fits our collecting policy because it might get lost. So yeah, there are four collecting streams and Noel started it. He started off collecting the company records and after a few years of business research, well, the other side of that story of business is labour. They need each other. So I started acquiring trade union records um, from the ACTU to waterside workers, Siemens Union, coal miners, all sorts of things. And we're focusing on nationally significant companies like um, CSR, Burnsfield, um, stock exchanges. We've got a lot of huge collection from the um, Australian Securities Exchange, which included the Sydney Stock Exchange um, a few years ago, which we're still working on. Um, federally registered trade unions and their branches, professional associations. So we're not just business and labour, the, the basic companies and trade unions, we're also the, the advocates. So we have some New South Wales Farmers Federation and we also have the Institute of Public Affairs, um, some of their records as well. So the idea is that you can look at a topic from different perspectives, which is always what you want to do. And a lot of activists either connected with the trade union movement or AIDS activists or others, I mean, who are interested in various uh, elements of, of social justice. So I'm focusing today on New South Wales, obviously. Um, so we'll have New South Wales uh, head, head office, so the, the New South Wales branch of the Waterside Workers or Siemens Union will have a lot of their records. And we'll also have um, some of the sub-branches, those that were significant enough to create, to be worth their own sub-branch. So for the waterside workers, Port Kembla, um, the, the Sydney waterfront, um, just some of the, the um, New South Wales based sub-branches that, that were quite significant. Um, we also have New South Wales Teachers uh, Federation, New South Wales Nurses, um so and and coal miners and often there's a bit of overlap between the head office if it was in sydney and often it was 
and the New South Wales branch. So sometimes people need to look in both collections to find what they're, they're looking for. Um, companies, a lot of the companies had their head office in Sydney. Um, we have a good collection from, of CSR records from Piermont when they were based there with the sugar refinery. Um, and they've been used not just to research the sugar industry and what happened there, but also for the heritage of the area since it's changed so dramatically since CSR left and it's been redeveloped and to be something quite different. And some of those records of CSR are particularly useful for people who are researching um, family history. There, and, and a lot of our records are, um, a, a lot of the staff and the union member members if they were, particularly if they were blue collar workers, they didn't leave a lot of written records, didn't necessarily keep diaries or correspondence. And often the only place to find a trace of them is, is of them either being a member of a union or um, being employed on a production line for CSR at Piedmont where you can get to see what they did, how much they got paid, how much, how well they were. Um, one thing I admitted here, it's a serious omission, um, is the friendly societies. So before, a lot of the friendly societies have evolved to become insurance companies and Australian Unity is the descendant of a lot of them. So we have Grand United Independent Order of Odd Fellows. If you know about the uh, friendly societies, then um, you'll know that they were based on a geographical area and they provided some sort of support, lodge meetings, help with paying for funerals, help with getting medical care. Um, and sometimes they've got really good collections of information about the people in, the, in that area and the activities of the Friendly Society. Um, they're not a record that gets a lot of attention, so we're trying to promote them um, more because they, they've sort of, people aren't doing that sort of thing anymore and, and have moved on from it and it's not at the forefront of researchers' minds. But particularly for genealogical research, they can be quite useful. Um, we have Mort Stock and Engineering Company, lots of uh, records about them. And in a company, um, records is records of the activities of the company, the some of the employees and their um, there are also, can also be records about the built environment. So the fabric of the building, the general area, and particularly for things like Lake George Mining Company near Captain's Flat near here, and the pastoral companies. Um, there are a lot of maps and plans, design drawings, not always. Um, some of the Tooth and Company records, we have got plans of the building but I'll get to Tooth and Company on its, as a separate um, entity in, in a minute. Um, so on the, uh, the slide, which I'll give to Donna to circulate, there's a hyperlink to our open repository, our online repository, which we put digitized records on so anyone can get them and they're free to, to anyone. There's no cost to download. Um, I should say also we're open to any, anyone, despite being part of the university, we're open to anyone, anywhere, um, which is one of the good things about being um, a public institution where, and senior management are all very keen to share what we have as widely as possible. So it can be used for all sorts of research from family history to academic to publications. Um, so, I was going to show you the, the maps and plans, but I think I'll wait and show you our online repository as a whole in, in a few minutes. Um, so there's a bit of a, an idea about what we have in the companies and Tooth and Company, which I'll focus on a bit because every area has a hotel, um, is one of our biggest and most popular collections. Um, so Tooth and Company is a bit of its, its overview uh, from 1835 when they opened the Kent Brewery in Sydney and I went to UTS sometime in the pre-COVID world um, and was interested to see that the facade is, is still intact with its white horse across the road from, from UTS in, um, in Sydney. So it's a, a, an example of a very 
long-lived company with fortunately a great collection of records. Um, a lot of organisations don't keep their records, not out of malice or anything, but because they don't see the past as um, having anything to do with what they're doing in, in the modern day, which is a bit sad. Um, but other companies do see that. They, they draw on their heritage for promotion um, and are very happy to have their, their archives and draw on them constantly to remind their customers and the public that they have a long history. But fortunately, Tooth & Company kept a lot of their records um, and we've got a lot, a lot of their, um, their history, particularly from um, the 1920s when they started buying and building hotels of their own. So up until then, they'd been very involved in brewing beer and then just letting the distribution be a separate uh, area. But then I think the correct term is vertical integration. Uh, you have the product and then you also have the, the way to distribute it. By owning hotels, you tied them to yourself. You tied them to you as, um, if possible, the sole provider. Um, so Tooth & Company either owned every hotel or supplied a lot of hotels. And for that reason, they've got records about hotels all over New South Wales and a little bit into Queensland as well, border areas. Um, and they acquired a lot of local um, breweries and uh, businesses that outside of, of Sydney. So initially, initially a Sydney company, and I try not to be too Sydney centric here. I know that's not helpful. Um, it's just a lot of places had a head office in Sydney and that's what the focus is. But fortunately, Tooth & Company were, were throughout New South Wales and you can see they have records from Maitland, um, Newcastle, Wagga, Narandra, Goulburn um, and the Mittagong Maltings. Uh, we have quite a lot of records from, from there as well. Um, and things went on quite well. They owned hotels, they acquired more, they controlled more, and so they documented that. People document what they're interested in, usually money. Um, until the, the 80s, the 80s happened to a lot of organisations and not in a good way. A lot of organisations expanded beyond what they were used to and their area of expertise and acquired and acquired and acquired. And we've seen that with Burns Philp and CSR Adelaide Steamship Company, which is not a New South Wales business, but it's a good example of a company being very good in one area. And then just in the 1980s, there's a lot of expansion into other areas. And Tooth and Company did that. So they acquired Carlton United Breweries, a huge, but it didn't work. And I don't know enough about economics to fully explain why. But it started to go downhill and, and lose. Um, lose its its ability to do things. Um, so yeah, they they expanded, were taken over, rebranded. The company started selling off its its hotels in the nineteen nineties, um, and eventually in twenty ten, it it ceased to exist. They listed from the Securities Exchange, and. Um, is really just remembered as a, a collection of records um, and an accountant for working for KPMG looks after their residual assets and obligations. So it's really quite a sad story. There's a great story of growth and expansion and then suddenly it all collapsed. And then fortunately that's not, unfortunately that's not uncommon for companies. Um, the only good thing is that so often that's how and when we get archives when they cease to be needed or the organisation is, is coming to an end. And sometimes people don't notice them, the records, and they just fade away. And other times they see it's important as a way of acknowledging and remembering what happened and they give them to us. And we're very happy to have the Tooth & Company records. Um, I'll try if this works to take you to an online exhibition we've done for Tooth & Company um, that sort of 
summarises the, the history and gives you an idea of the vast uh, array of records that we have. And the company, as well as producing beer and, and distributing it, owning the hotels, and that's what they documented. They documented the buildings and the licensees, and, and I'll show you an example of one of their summary records uh, in a moment that they kept for, for everyone. And they're a great source of information for all sorts of purposes. So this exhibition that we did, oh, for crying out loud, that would be normal. Um, that would be right. I, was, I can talk about hotels for a long time. Um, not that long. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm good for that. By in the records that um, that we have, if I, the, the Tooth and Company would photograph the outside of the hotel every ten year ten years, and they started seriously owning them in the nineteen twenties. So often the first photograph is of a the first building that was on the site, and then. Um, the building was demolished and replaced. And so you get to see the development over the years. So on our, just, just some of the examples of the photo, photographic records are, are fantastic for the built environment and also the clothes and the people who was there. Um, and they cover all of New South Wales. And these are just a few examples of the ones we thought were particularly interesting and this one we kept keep getting asked for copies of this to represent various newspaper articles and in books it's the bondi hotel on a saturday afternoon um, with the poor besieged um, barmaid and the, and all the the men wanting, wanting their their drinks and the crowd in the air in the bar um, I mean, the photographs themselves to show you an awful lot of of what life was like. Um, so we've got a link to the, the company history, um, which you can look through if you're interested. But just try part of the reason for this um, ex online exhibition is as an online finding aid, so we can show people here's an overview, and here are some of the more interesting um, pieces of information. So people get excited about seeing the horses and the way the barrels and the way they used to go about uh, doing their work is so different from what you see now. Um, There's a bit of information about how to find hotel records. We have some plans, um, photographs, uh, drawings, um, the Tooth Brewery had a band, which we got some photographs from the descendant of one of the band members, which was lovely. And we got some records about who some of the licensees were. Uh, and the advertising is great. It's so good to see, um, not necessarily the sort of advertising that would be used today, but the history of advertising and how uh, the company was portrayed. And we've just highlighted a few. We use the word notorious hotels for um, sites of murders, riots, political intrigue, um, all sorts of things. Geraldry, where Ned Kelly was. Um, the Great Northern Hotel is a company, a hotel that has changed so dramatically. And the early hotel photographs, and we'll show you try to show you if you haven't already seen it, if you haven't been to Newcastle, the beautiful Art Deco version that this um, replaced this. But a lot of people like to see what the early hotels looked like. And in a lot of, uh, in a, a number of places, they, the hotels have changed a lot, like taking away these verandas and balconies. Uh, so the, the, one of the good things about these photographs is that you can see what was there 
And also the streetscape, the cars, people get excited about the cars, the clothes, the buildings on either side. Um, and these, these photographs exist for almost every hotel that Tooth had an interest in. Either they owned it and supplied it, or they were the competition and they wanted to keep an eye on it. Um, and sometimes begrudgingly, they, they, they'd share um, and, and sell their products to a, a Tui's hotel uh, if they thought uh, business is business. So we have so, some information about that. And one of the things that we've done that great, well, my colleague did this and it was a very big job, is to try to come, come up with a map uh, based on Google Maps. Pick an area, you can either search for a hotel or pick an area and see what hotels there were and then get a link to the, um, the main record that we have. Please work. Good. Um, the main record that we have about hotels are these, which we call the yellow cards because they are yellow and they're one of the most interesting tooth and company and most popular. Um, they are a double-sided card. On one side, there's information about uh, which, about general information about the hotel. Only a certain number were allowed per electorate. Um, the graphs uh, show how much product to supply to the hotel over the years. Um, here there are the names of licensees. And on the back of, into a bigger version, no, I have to download it. On the back of the hotel, the card, usually. This behaves, is, um, okay. So that's a, a, a lot a larger version of the front. So the electorate, uh, licensees, um, the, it was a leasehold owned by, by um, Tooths and they had to put in a, li a licensee. Um, right now, go back to, okay. Okay. The, 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 the back of the card will have a photograph. Um, and these are the, the, the photographs that are so popular with all sorts of researchers. Yeah, that's a in large version. Um, so we've got thousands of these cards and we had a very large digitization project um, to digitize them, to do the metadata, to put them up on the internet so they're freely available to everyone. Um, so yeah, that map is in here, in, um, sorry. So the map that's part of this online exhibition that I'll send, I'll send the slides around and it's doing that again. So you can either search for if you know the name of the hotel, you can search for it and you find that there are quite a few great northern hotels around New South Wales. We'll try to look at the one in Newcastle. Um, it's just done on Google Maps. One of our colleagues from another section of the university did this for us. Um, it was a huge task, but we're hoping that it's something that will be useful to researchers wherever they are to find out not only um, what 
and not only about an individual hotel like that, but what um, there was in a town. So there's the original uh, hotel as Tooth acquired it in the 1920s. Um, then they demolished it and built one in the style of the day, the, the Art Deco style, which is, um, I think, still there. So you can see the development of the um, of the hotel over over the years and the street, which people also get very excited about because there aren't a lot of records about um, about streetscapes that we are aware of. So they're they're very popular, which is is good to see. Um, right, so. That's a bit of information about um, Tooth and Company hotels. I don't know why it does that. I think um, it's very awkward. So that's one of the things that um, we did as, as archivists was trying, is trying to produce an online finding aid, an online way of helping people to find what they're looking for. And it's a lot of work, but I think it's, it's been very useful. We've got good feedback from people about um, how it's allowed them to, to find, to find um, these smaller um, hotels that some, many of which no longer exist, but what was in, the, in an area and what the places look like. So that's one of the things that we're very, very happy to have done and it's been very useful for a lot of researchers. And it's, I mean, we, we, we as an a section and also the, the university are very keen to share information as much as possible um, with as many people as possible because it's very, it's, it can be a bit, a bit disappointing to find out that someone's been doing a research project. We could have helped them, but they didn't know about us. So we're trying to, by having it, uh, everything findable through through a search engine, that more people will be able to, to find us and use us. Um, so yeah, there, there lists to the there are in uh, links to the general digitized records that we have. So in general, for Tooth and Company, please work. We've got a few digitized records, and this is our open research repository. So there are advertisements and signs, maps and plans. We don't have plans for every hotel. Um, in fact, we don't have plans for a lot of them, but whatever we have, whenever we come across them, we try to put them up on um, the web so people can find them. Lots of photographs from the breweries, events, um, Tooth divided their records when they kept them between the country and the city hotels. So we, we've maintained that. Um, so you, you search through two, two things, or you, you can actually search it above at a higher level. Um, but one of the things that they have that we've digitized, they're commuting to um, uh, all sorts of researchers is information about people who served in the war. And lots of companies did that. There are honor boards for World War One, World War Two, um, and the the company had more sort of there's a different relationship often between a company and its employees, where the people stay for a long, long time. So they put these records up. Um, they they acknowledge the service of people who had served in the war, and if they had had died, they kept note of that. Um, so we've, we're digitizing things that we think will appeal to the major, to, a, to a large number of researchers, whether they're family history or um, war time or any, any other area. Um, they have some unusual records that you wouldn't expect to find necessarily. Um, so we've, 
we're trying to digitize them and put them out there so that people can see. And often they're the, the great and the good of, um, of Tooth and Company, um, senior directors and managers, uh, sometimes groups of employees. And often we don't know who they are. So if anyone ever sees these records and is able to identify people who aren't, who aren't identified, it's great if they can let us know. Okay, so um, let's quickly talk about the things that we don't haven't digitized. We have an enormous collection of records and digitization is very expensive. We worked out it would cost hundred take hundreds of years and cost hundreds of millions of dollars to digitize everything and then you've got to manage a digital record but um, this is our database and it's searchable through a search engine and um, it, it I can understand what Elizabeth was saying and other researchers have said about this means nothing to researchers um, this sort of information, it means everything to us who, who manage it. So ideally we can come up with a way that makes sense to everyone. Um, so this is the first deposit that we got from Tooth and & Company. And then you can search, you can either do a report and get a, a list or you can search for some, for, for a, um, a particular type of record. Um, and all of these records will, will come up. Um, I want to show you some of the important records that, yeah, N60. Um, this is an enormous collection. Um, so there are a lot of records that we haven't digitized that are potentially of use to researchers, but they take a bit of a commitment to looking through. Um, so the manager's files and the property files. They're, as well as the yellow cards, which are very popular and they give a great summary, the manager and property files. The property file is about the, um, the fabric of the building how many bathrooms, when it was renovated, when it got in trouble with the council for not being up to code and what was done with it. And the manager's um, files deal with the lease, the licensee. Every time the license comes up for renewal, the licensee would say, oh, I'd love to be able to pay more money, but we've had a really bad run. Um, we're not making the profit that we used to. We really can't afford to pay, to pay a greater license fee. And then the company would argue, well, you're, you're buying more from us. So clearly you're selling more. So, or yeah, the, the licensee has been, it's, it's a, a woman who's just been widowed and um, is struggling. So we won't raise the, the license fee this time around. So the, our database um, is on our website and accessible through Google. So people can search, um, can search up here for the name of a hotel if they can't come directly to the, the Tooth & Company um, in, uh, item lists. So you find information through database, our online repository, and we're also harvested by Trove, records about our, the, the, the companies and the people in the organization, the organizations, the record collectors, Record creators are harvested by Trove and records at the collection level when they're not the item level. Um, we welcome people contacting us. Um, this is a link to our website, our email address, phone number. We're on Facebook and one of my colleagues regularly puts up um, posts, which um, is shared with local government, uh, local history societies and hotel enthusiasts and anyone we can think of and they got a lot of um a lot of views and a lot of good feedback and we're on twitter as well so yeah that's um 
an overview of that. And that's all I was really wanting to say today. I hope it's been helpful. Does anyone have any questions? Well, I just got a question. He's just put on chat. Okay, where are we? Just a sec. Um, did Noel Butling get much in the way of two, three Alia bottles, etc.? We got a few bottles, uh, not a lot. Powerhouse Museum got some things, I understand. One thing we did get, which we could have done without, was a box of cans that had been unopened, so full cans of beer. Um, <laughs> and quite a, some of them leaked. And one of my colleagues went and fortunately went outside and opened one, and the pressure just drenched her in beer. So we've kept them. We don't want, we don't want to dispose of them because the cans and the, the advertising on the cans and the way that they um, decorated them and the, the, the designs of them tell an interesting story in itself. So um, we just keep them carefully sealed in plastic and we have had exhibitions where we've pulled them out and shown them to people. Um, the one I remember is the Tooth Dinner Ale, which is a very big can. We, we're too scared to open it. But I, it, a lot of the realia that existed, I think the powerhouse has some. Mittagong Maltings, there's, Mittagong has a small museum and they talk about the Maltings as well. Um, so there are bits and pieces there. Um, being an archive, we're not really set up for objects. Um, the, we don't have the resources to be a museum as well. So um, we don't, we, we get the odd bits and pieces on the way, but encourage people to find a better um, home for objects at a museum where they, they know how to manage them. But we have, we do have a few bottles um, as well, and we, we keep them, we don't dispose of them, but um, we're not the best place to look for, for realia. So Angela's got a question. Um, what percentage of hotels in, sorry, I've lost it, percentage of hotels in New South Wales were managed or owned by Toots? Uh, I couldn't tell you the exact um, percentage except to say a lot. Right. Because we have thousands of those yellow cards. And you can tell when you look at them if there are only one or two immense that tooth only had a minor interest, like just supplied them with a, a, oh. some of their beer. And most of the cards are every 10 years, multiple, multiple, multiple cards meant they had a longer interest in um, long-term interest in them in the hotel. So it was more common to be a tooth hotel than to not be. Um, I don't know what's become of TUI's records and I was interested to see if I could find out about um, South Australian um, brewery records because the two, I, I used to live, live there, the two I remember were Coopers and West End. I think Coopers is still a family owned company. Um, so I wanted to see if they had similar records but you can't get into their, into their um, collection very easily. So I think there are only a limited number of brewers. It's not like now where there seem to be um, microbreweries and artisanal breweries. Um, so there are only a small number of potential suppliers to hotels. So um, it's I, I bet it's more likely to be a tooth hotel than not. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Sarah. That was great. And I know what I'll be doing this afternoon. <laughs> um, I'll send you, Donna, I'll send you the slides because I've got the hyperlinks and people can play around with them. But everyone and, should check out your online exhibitions. They're amazing. Oh, thank you. They're just Sarah. great. We do physical exhibitions, but there aren't, um, you know, there are only so many people coming to our building at ANU. So it's a good way of telling the world what we have and getting many archives that aren't like national or state yeah. level suffer from um, relevance deprivation syndrome. Right. We think we could help so many people if they just knew about us. Okay. Well, we're happy to promote what you do. 
Thank it's you. fantastic. So thank you very much for that. It was very, very interesting. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Stop sharing my screen. <laughs> if I can work out how to do it. Okay. Stop share. Oh, here we go. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now we, we can have a short um, morning tea break and come back at 11.30 for local studies in a flash and general business. So see you in 30 minutes, everyone. Marilyn? Can't see her. Um, Helen, do you want to go first? Okay, I'll try to. I haven't done this before, so bear with me. I okay. Listen to Ellen's remarks, so I'll give it a go. I'll share the screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, great. Excellent. I might even try to go. Okay, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the Who Do You Think You Are experience. Um, it was quite unexpected, to say the least. Um, and it was all due to this man, Joseph Springle, who was always very special, but interestingly, never had a very big place in our local history, although um, he is a very big part of it. There hadn't been very much done about him. And so he wasn't really all that widely known. So he was a bit more of a footnote than a major player. And interestingly also, no one had ever claimed him. Um, so there was always a story waiting to be told. And it all began with a photo album. And it was not a very exciting cover, but it was interesting in the sense that it was um, a photo album of um, pre-1900 photographs um, sadly, and I have to say, it came into the collection well before I started, um, had no provenance, uh, so we didn't know anything about it. We didn't know who donated it or anything about why it was in the collection other than it was original material and we were very happy to have it. Um, there was a date. It was 1889, so we knew that much, and the uh, photos of this building under construction was the Oriental Hotel. So we were able to piece together enough to um, do something with it, but um, it only gave us some really tantalising insights into the pre-history, uh, pre-1900 history of the Sutherland Shire. So we added the photos to the database in the hope that one day we would get somebody coming forward to tell us a little bit more about Joseph Springle and his um, time in the Sutherland area. And in the meantime, um, I often gathered together bits and pieces of his life from things like post office history and some local histories that people had done over the years. So, you know, he wasn't completely on his own, but um, he wasn't also very much in mind's eye. So it was interesting that one day I, I didn't actually get the call. It came through just our library general um, phone emails. And it was a question from the Who Do You Think You Are research team asking about Joseph and did I think that the Joseph that was on our website was the Joseph they were looking for. So it all started as a, a matter of, well, you know, can you tell us in time what this, who this person is? And I immediately said, yes, he's yours. And the researcher kind of was a bit dubious, I think, at first that I could know this. But anyway, he did turn out to be the one that they were looking for. And one of the images um, that led to, to this connection was this one, which is the National Park had a, a, pro, a program of road building that was looked after by the Casual Labor Board. And um, Joseph was actually employed by them as a um, storekeeper, which meant that he was in charge of pay distribution and looking after the site. So we had a connection with Joseph through the Casual Labor Board. And he actually managed to, by fair means or foul, um, to amass a reasonable amount of money from working for the Casual Labor Board. So his next move 
was interesting because quite often with people that have worked and lived in or worked in the area, they don't tend to stay around in the Sutherland area and particularly at this time because there was really not much around and this is an early photograph of the Cronulla Beach area and there's really nothing there. So Joseph decided to stay and um, develop, purchase some land with his money and build a hotel. So it was a fairly probably brave move on his part and once again, we really weren't particularly sure uh, why it was that he did it. Um, but obviously he could see some potential and this um, locality plan is one of our latest subdivision plans showing that, yes, indeed, Cronulla in Sutherland Shire became quite a, a popular area as it is today. So he wasn't far wrong. So it was about telling the story and that was working with the researcher from Who Do You Think You Are?, piecing together personal information about Joseph, which was mostly her job, and then looking at the reasons perhaps why he was coming to the area, and that was access. There was improved access through a punt that went over the Georges River, and it was reported in the local press that Cronulla was a, a you know, perhaps an area that, you, you know, people might be interested in going to. So there was a story being pieced together, which gave us some reasons to why Joseph was coming out. So it wasn't until the end of the process of working with the researcher over a few months um, and the stories sort of getting more in depth and getting more calls and more emails. So I kind of figured we were getting close to being part of the, the story. And um, it wasn't until nearly the end that it was, um, I was asked, did I want to be part of the show? And also then having the name of the celebrity released, which, as you know, is quite top secret, confidential, and you get hassled by everybody who wants to know who it is. Um, so at that stage, um, it was all go for doing some reporting um, in the area, of course, at Cronulla. And this is uh, Chris Bath, who was the presenter, who was a celebrity um, newsreader and presenter and worked on radio and other projects. This is her standing on the looking towards the site of the Oriental Hotel, which turns out to be her ancestors, um, you know, Joseph Springle on her mother's side. Um, it's her um, looking up to the site as to where the, the hotel was. And I have to say, she was hoping for a villa in Tuscany, and but had to make do with uh, Joseph having a hotel at Cronulla. And she was actually quite proud of the fact that he obviously was a visionary um, in the sense that he took chance in an area where there was little development. And you can see here, she's actually looking at a photo of the Oriental Hotel. So I think she was a bit chuffed that he at least um, had a big part in how the Sutherland Shire developed. And she'd never actually been to the Sutherland Shire before. So it was an eye opener to her as well. So we spent a lot of time on the Bundina Ferry, which is what's pictured here. And um, that in itself was challenging because there was boat noise, there was Gunnamatta Bay noise, which is where the, Bund the Bundinda Ferry goes. Um, and also we had, I mean, naively thought, oh, you know, just do one take and that's it. Well, no, you do it several times over and you have to remember what you've said. Um, you hold all of the sources in your hand <laughs> and it was really very, very challenging. And, and we had weather conditions. It was a very hot day. And, of course, in the afternoon there was a storm, so we had to relocate to another location. So on the night itself, I was quite amazed that it turned out to be so cool, calm and collected because in real life it was really not. <laughs> so, but having said that, um, it was a great opportunity. I had a much better appreciation of the collection and the connection we actually established with the community. We also you always use social media, but we had a really big following for me being part of the show and the local community being quite proud of their local studies librarian being on television. Uh, it refocused, as always it does when you're sort of doing local history, how important um, your history is in the state and in Australia. And it also reinforced that commitment to presenting local history using storytelling. It's just an amazing way to do it. I mean, even I was thinking, well, what's going to happen next? And also it was a really great opportunity, which you know, if you ever get the opportunity, I highly recommend it. It's, it's worth every minute. 
So thank you. Thank you, that was great. Any questions? Um, I just wanted to mention, um, Helen, I saw you and I was very proud of you in that episode. <laughs> and thank you. Um, I, I did a, uh, an episode with Ray Martin probably about five years ago and every time that's repeated on TV, I still get people come up and say to me, oh, that was great. So it is, it is it does give you a good focus on your collection. It well does. Done. Thank well you. Done. Thanks, Michelle. Yes, I remembered your stint. I was quite proud of you as well. <laughs> I think local <laughs> studies librarians just do a great job. You've got to be very diverse in your skills. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jenny, you right? Stop yeah, sharing. I'm right. Um, yeah, so I'm Jenny McConkey. I work at the Wollongong City Library in the local studies section. And I'll just start sharing my screen. and start my slideshow. So what I've been asked to talk about today is an online exhibition that our library has put up on our website called Steelworks, The Backbone. So it was put up for History Week in 2021. And the name is just fabulous because really, the Steelworks is the backbone of the Illawarra. It started since 1920s and, you know, it's the major, it's been the major employer, even though the numbers are down now, really the other people that used to be employed directly are employed by other companies that work for them. You know, the minute there's any sort of, hint of trouble at the Steelworks financially, the whole region is sort of in a flutter and we're all worried. And then just on a personal note, you know, even where I'm living today, my husband worked at the Steelworks, the man next door worked at the Steelworks when I grew up. The people on either side of me worked at the Steelworks. We all knew someone who worked at the Steelworks. It would impinge on our way of life because you know, you might have a shift worker in the house, so you had to be quiet in the day because they were asleep. You know, everybody has a link to the steelworks. So it's a great um, exhibition, and we have thousands of photos of the steelworks and industrial photos, and they keep coming in. So, you know, we thought, oh, we had a big collection, but even last year, someone brought in, you know, four rusty little filing drawers full of negatives of the steelworks for us. So, you know, it's never ending how many steelworks photos we've got. So I thought I would just start quickly, if my thing works, by showing you the exhibition. So, and so here's the exhibition, and this is an absolutely wonderful photo of somebody standing in the blooming mill motor. My husband gave me an um, instructions on what the blooming mill motor was, but I've forgotten. Anyhow, so there's the open shop, which we were able to use as the front screen on the library webpage during History Week, like as the first image that people saw. Um, and I'll just quickly show you how it looks. So starts off there. You can link through to our Illawarra Images collection, which is, you know, always growing, especially during lockdown. And then it goes on to a slideshow. So here is a very first photo, 1927 excavation for the first um, blast furnace at the Steelworks. So you can scroll through it just like that. So there's some absolutely gems of photos, like, you know, nowadays someone would be in jail for allowing someone to sit up this high on something without any um, restraint or harnesses or what have you, but it happened then. So anyhow, so that's 
one way of looking at it, or you can scroll down here to all the thumbnails. So it's sort of a cavalcade of photos through the years from the start through to, so here in the 1950s, I always remember this road here because we would wind up our window if we drew, drove past there because the smell was so terrible. And if you drove through there at any time that was Stuart's closing time, it would be an absolute traffic jam. So you wouldn't go there, um, yeah, change a shift and you would certainly wind up the window. But now you don't have to wind up the window because they are really on top of, well, let, and people would say there's always room for improvement, but they have improved a lot. Anyhow, so when we scroll down through the cavalcade of photos to the more modern ones that are here. So you get in these thumbnails, you get a brief description about the photos. So here we've got some steel workers picketing in 1991 outside BHP's Spring Hill Works. And so one of our staff wrote all these little brief blurbs and then next to it is a P number, which is our individual image number. So every photo has an individual image number. You can type that number into our catalog and it will bring you immediately to the photo. So I think if I click on one of the photos, it just takes me to this view here of the photo. So we had selected, here we've selected 20 images, but you know, probably the amount of images we could have used, it's just, you know, unending, unending. Anyhow, so that's my first slide. So let's see, I'm, I'm just go on to. So I thought I would talk about for us, even in COVID lockdown, particularly because of the number of images that we've got to work, to work on. Um, we've got so much work to do, years and years of work. Um, so we can't afford to do anything unless it's got a real aim to it. So in our plan of action, one of the um, things that we've got is plan to promote access to the local studies collection through, through visual and interactive technologies. And one of the staff, my colleagues, Joe Oliver, is really good on prompting us to be involved in things that might promote our collection and help us, um, yeah, because as other people would know, you know, we've got a wonderful collection, but getting the word out there about our wonderful collection is really tricky. In our council, we're not allowed to talk directly to the media at all. We get in trouble for doing that. So we can't even just ring up the radio station and say, oh, we've got this good thing, you know, would you like to hear about it? So by being involved in History Week with this exhibition. So it, it's registered on the History Council of New South Wales website. But by doing that, we had a flow on effect that it ended up being promoted on the Royal Australian Historical Society website. I saw it on What's On in Sydney and locally, it's in Lost Illawarra and the Migrant Heritage Project. So I would say to people, you know, it is a worthwhile thing to be involved in Heritage Week. You can register your um, project. It also, like, it, I don't know what happened locally, but sometimes if we registered a project, then the council media team might actually write about it um, and release it to the local newspaper or the local radio station. And our digital team can obviously promote it on social media. So really within the library, all we can do is um, we've got some staff that can do social media for us. Any other media has to go through the council media team and they are so busy that it's hard to get mentioned. Anyhow, so that was our aim. And uh, the two things obviously that we were hoping to promote 
was our Illawarra Images collection. So here's just an example of at the back end of it, the photo of the man at the blooming mill is from our catalog collection here. So um, that's fairly obvious that we're wanting to promote Illawarra images. And the other thing that we're wanting to promote is our Illawarra story. So that's our oral history website. And um, COVID lockdown has really helped us to power ahead with um, some back end work for our Illawarra stories. Of course, we've even got other staff that are non local people working on Amplify to transcribe some of the Illawarra stories. Um, but unfortunately, up until now, we haven't been able to go out and um, do some more stories. But if we click here onto the website for Illawarra stories, yeah. We've actually got at the moment the, um, if we click on community stories, it works, maybe not. We've got the, the exhibition listed as a community story. Now this is really, when I spoke to Joe, who does our oral histories, it's really because at the moment we don't have a platform that is just for online exhibitions if we want to keep it up permanently. So at the moment, it's sitting under our Illawarra stories. Um, but really, it just relates to so many of the other stories um, that we've got here, because if you clicked on any of these pages and listened to the stories of people, part of their story would link to the steelworks because it's just part of the fabric of our community. So I'm just a bit... Back. Yeah, so what's next for our exhibition for this kind of plan? Well, it obviously, it's created a wonderful template that we could do again and again. We did um, buy a series of frames and there's a space in our library, a multi-purpose space that we started to have some exhibitions in person. Like we, after last year's COVID lockdown, we had a COVID exhibition and we've had then and now exhibitions and what have you. Um, but this year we couldn't do that. So it's forced us to go into the online platform. So our question is, which maybe someone else has an answer to is, you know, how can we create a space to permanently, um, you know, have these exhibitions online and then we can build on them. So other ones we've had, yeah, we had a Croker Island exhibition because it turned out that in World War II, children from Croker Island were sent to Otford to live to um, be safe from the Japanese. So some of these other exhibitions that we've already done, we could obviously work towards putting up in the same way. And lastly, just to acknowledge the work of our staff. So it really was a team effort to get um, the exhibition up and going. So. We've got so many images to choose from. So we had someone had to select the images, write a brief description of them. Another person, you know, wrote a submission to the History Council, like just the registration of the event. And then we worked with our digital services team who helped us to put the exhibition up onto our website. So um, yeah, without that team effort, we couldn't have done it because one person in our organisation doesn't have enough time to do it. Anyhow, I think that is the end of my little talk about um, our exhibition. So does anybody have any questions or I'm happy to shut up? Stop, stop sharing.
I can't hear you, Donna. You've got your microphone off. I'm muted. Um, the Noel Butlin website has some very good online exhibitions. They've got a dedicated page. That might be worth looking at. Yeah, I saw that. So yeah. I did think that. Yeah, could work it's well. Just that there's just so many wonderful options for things that we could be doing, yeah. you know, with our time. So the, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, but I didn't, is we've also, um, my teammate Catherine has developed some online jigsaw puzzles using the, um, the images as well. So, you know, there's just, they're just different ways to present yeah. what we've got like, and not necessarily like other things, people are looking at them because they want to find some facts or they want to find an image. But the exhibition or the jigsaw puzzle is just because we're interested, mm. like, or we want to fill in our time. It's a different way of engaging with people or possibly engaging with someone who if would never come and research using our resources, but they, oh, it's quite fun to have, oh, look how, you know, Port Kembla looked mm. in 1920 or look at this funny jigsaw puzzle, you know, picture. So there's lots of possibilities as well for um, things that we've done in the past, you know, like, you know, then put recreating the that as an online exhibition when we've done things for special events and, and things like that, you can you've already done the research um, and you've got the access to the images. It's just presenting it in a, in a different way. Yeah. A different market. It yeah. Would be quick. Like it's a quick way of if you, if we started up or any of us started up to get some content up and going, if you rework with what you've already done, because again, the people who would have might've seen something, if you did it in the library premises will be, possibly different people to who might see it if you do it online. There is a question which I think we're all wondering, what's the image behind you? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> yeah. Just before, luckily I got a holiday in just before last year's COVID lockdown. About two Decembers ago, I went to Melbourne, and that's the Cause ex Exhibition. I think it's K-A-A-W-S. It's some sort of artist. My friend wanted to go to the National Gallery of Victoria, and that's one of his <laughs> and me. So luckily we got that in before, Very good. you know, there was a roadblock <laughs> at the border with Victoria. Well, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, thanks, Jennifer. That was good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, next up is Jeff. Jeff? My headphones, my headphones are dying, so uh, just bear with. You're right. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thanks, Jeff. Great. All right, now I've just got to set this up. Um, how do we actually present online? Sorry. Okay, to share, uh, if you mouse to the bottom of the screen, there's a share screen option, but you'll need to have your PowerPoint presentation open first. Okay, uh, just share screen, got it. Got it. Um, if you press the, the from beginning one, that should um, work. Yep. Yep. Uh huh. We right now? It hasn't changed. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're also, uh, Jeff, we're also seeing your trailing screen. So what you'll actually have to do is there'll be an option up the top that you need to mirror screens. I'm guessing you've got two screens. Um, unshare. Um, 
Yeah, if you could stop sharing, because it's just we can see your next screen and all your notes. So if you unshare, and then when you press the slide share again, there's an option to, it's something like mirror screen, and you need to select that so we don't see your next slide and notes. I'm getting tech help. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. So I've got to unshare. And it's just, it's the option. You'll end up with everything kind of mirrored, but but it's the only way we won't see your notes and the trailing screen. We'll see the slides you want us to see. I can stop your sharing and then you can reshare. Do you want to go on with someone else and I'll. Oh. Jeff, you just, if you go back to the sc screen share, get your Hello. PowerPoint up. Hello. Bring the, yeah, bring the PowerPoint up. Bring the PowerPoint up, press scre screen share, but before you go to full slide share, that's when the choice comes in. Yeah. Right. Yep. This is why I should never get let loose on. No, it's really it. it you can't actually know in advance that you're going to have this problem because it depends on how your screens are set up, how PowerPoint's set up. It's a horrible lot of variables. Yeah. Sorry, we're just getting sorted out. That's all right. good. In my head, this was all going to go so smoothly. It always does. Oh, this is Mark, by the way. Hello, Mark. Yeah, so you need to do the screen share of, yep, and beautiful. I think that, that beautiful. Great. To move forward okay all right sorry about that folks now let's get started um, this presentation outlines how the former gosford lga used to assign street names and in particular how one little book influenced not only what happened in our area but what may have happened in a multitude of places across australia by acknowledging the traditional owners of, uh, of the uh, lands on which we meet and pay my respects to the elders past and present, I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. So although home to Aboriginal peoples for many thousands of years, when Europeans came to the New South Wales Central Coast, the geography was too challenging and to provide much incentive to settle. Up to 1823, it was a no settlement buffer zone between uh, 
Sydney Cove and the Hunter River convict settlement. So between the Hawkesbury and the Hunter River, there was no settlement in the 18, up until the 1820s. Jeff? Yep. Can you talk a bit louder? Yeah, sure. My yeah. headphones are dying. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, I shall do my best. Um, so, in, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Great. In the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, early surveyors mapped the area, and many Aboriginal place names were fortunately recorded. Unfortunately, many meanings were not well recorded, but at least we have the early names attached to localities. The geography of the Central Coast remains challenging. From the 1836 map here, you will gather that many rugged sandstone hills divide endless lakes and estuaries in our district. So isolation leads to repetition. When settlement occurred, particularly in the former Gosford LGA, it was based around small shipbuilding villages, which were located near good stands of timber and where there was water deep enough to launch vessels. The resulting villages were isolated from one another and largely accessible only by water. This isolation led to each village developing a unique character. It also led to the tracks and roads in the vicinity being named in fairly obvious ways. So Wharf Road is a good example. In each village, there was a Wharf Road, which led to a Wharf, simple. Each of the places represented on the slide here, Yao Yao subdivision near Davistown, the Tonga Estate, Hooker Bay Estate, Gosford, and probably many more villages all had Wharf Roads. Now, there was no real problem with name duplication in the times when the villages were isolated. But as roads were improved, villages became better connected and street directories were printed. Confusion over the duplicated names began to manifest itself. Around this time, many new subdivisions were also being established and they all needed new street names. So what do you do in this case? In the late 1960s, Gosfordshire Council decided that it was time to rename many streets in villages around the district and to begin assigning names on a consistent basis to new subdivisions. With this in mind, a council staff member from the town planning section was given the responsibility for identifying and suggesting suitable street names. Some names were drawn from those of prominent white settler families in the locality. Other names came from a source that I will now describe. Eventually, a list of the approved names was published in the Government Gazette, street names assigned, signs made, etc. Now, where did the Aboriginal terms come from that were used in many of our street names? While Aboriginal word lists specific to particular tribal groups had long been compiled and published in various scientific journals. These probably remained largely unknown to most early 20th century white Australians. Now in 1924, a little book, Australian Aboriginal Native Words and Their Meanings, compiled by Sydney Endicott, was first published in Melbourne. Over time, several editions of this book were published with later versions having a descriptive blurb added to the cover, which very patronisingly reads, a choice of 3,000 pleasant sounding words from which to choose an appropriate Australian name. Endicott claimed no special language, uh, no special knowledge of Aboriginal culture or vocabularies. Words were chosen that ran trippingly off the tongue and these were drawn from a wide range of unrecorded sources in old books, newspapers, etc. It is believed that words come from all mainland states, but establishing just where they originated would be a major study in its own right. To his credit, Endicott in his foreword did point out the need to cultivate and maintain an Australian atmosphere over our, our lives and doings and so counter the apparently growing conviction that we are just a sort of suburb of New York or Paris 
or even of London. Now, at the time of its release in 1924, Indicott's book was probably unique. It gave everyday Australians a selection of Aboriginal words and a supposed meaning. The general public and state and local governments were quick to recognise the utility of such a, a publication. That this book was a great hit with local councils across Australia is unquestionable. On this slide is a Google Earth image of Coomba Park near Tunkurry, and most of the street names are Aboriginal terms taken straight from Endicott's book. Now this is repeated in many parts of Australia. Although many of the words appear to be from the mainland, even streets in subdivisions in Hobart have ironically used terms compiled by Endicott. At Gosford, we appear to have been late adopters of Endicott's work, but like many councils, this little work became a go-to one-stop shop solution for the naming of local roads. Although we cannot categorically state that all instances of the same words being used across Australia are entirely due to Endicott, <coughs> excuse me, there is a strong circumstantial case. Some terms may have been gathered by councils from random lists published in newspaper and magazine articles. But the case for Endicott builds where there are several or many names that appear in the 1924 book. This slide gives a picture of just how one term, Carinia, came to be used all over Australia in a multitude of places and situations. Add to that the adoption of words from Endicott as business or institutional names, and the legacy of the book becomes quite apparent. So you can see from this slide that. There are Carinia streets all over Australia. There are uh, Carinia roads, there's aged care homes. There is a ski ranch at Wiseman's Ferry, uh, hairdressing salons, correctional centres and so on. So you really get the idea of the reach of this, this one little book. Pros and cons. A choice of 2,000 pleasant sounding words from which to choose an appropriate Australian name is patronising to say the least. The book reflects a one size fits, or the use of the book reflects a one size fits all approach to Aboriginal words and hides the richness of the Australian Aboriginal vocabularies. It gives a wrong impression that street names are based on local terms. Uh, now, this is not an example from Endicott, but it illustrates the type of problem. Uh, Rumbalara Reserve at Gosford was named in the 1970s or 1980s. Now, Rumbalara apparently means rainbow in uh, the Yorta Yorta language of the Murray River district. Now, over time, people have come to believe, and aided by the internet, uh, the uh, local people have come to believe that that is a local term. And uh, so, uh, uh, a, and this would happen all over Australia and because of Endicott as well, that local terms, if they do exist, are kind of pushed out. Um, while drawn from across Australia, the words result, the use of the words in Endicott result in endless repetition across Australia. Use of more suitable local words may be blocked out by the use of generic terms. Once a street is named, it will only its street name will only change under exceptional circumstances. Uh, without background as to the sources, the accuracy and the origin of words could be highly questionable. The use of the terms in Endicott uh, could be said to be a very selective appropriation of Aboriginal language for non-traditional purposes. Uh, could some of the terms being used be secret or offensive or just wrong? Now, perhaps this could be, some of these could be, pro, these could be pros, uh, but they could equally be cons. Uh, the use of words from Endicott highlights a romantic 
an idealised version of Aboriginal and broader Australian life. It does encourage the use of Aboriginal words. And I suppose it is a form of acknowledgement that this always was Aboriginal land and always will be. Now, um, similar titles. There, there are a couple of titles which have been used to a, a limited degree in the same way as Endicott. There's the H.M. Cooper book, uh, the uh, Australian Aboriginal words, which some, some terms may be drawn from. Uh, more recently, A.W. Reid's Aboriginal words of Australia uh, could also have been used in a similar way to Endicott. If you're interested in looking at Endicott, there are numerous versions and editions online. Um, and look, I would strongly recommend that if you are um, if you are interested in street names in your area, go into Endicott. Uh, State Library of Victoria, in particular, has got one that's very easily accessible. And um, have a look and comp and just see if some of your local street names have come from Endicott, I would, I'm not a betting man, but I would say there's a very high certainty that um, Endicott has been involved to a fair degree in the neighbouring streets in your area. And that's pretty much it. So I'm, I'm really glad that the technology held together for that one. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions? There is one question. Bridget wants to know when it was published. 1924. 24. And there were there was um, several editions of it uh, created. It is available. You can get get copies on eBay. Uh, as I said, there are digitised copies online. And um, yeah, it, I, look, I think fundamentally because councils. Councils and institutions are looking for easy, easy fixes to problems. And this little book gave them a quick way to come up with what they thought were suitable terms for streets in an area. Um, I was looking at a Sydney street directory in, <coughs> excuse me, at the 1930s. And even by the 1930s, a lot of council areas closer to Sydney had adopted many terms from, from Endicott. That was fascinating, fascinating. Any other questions? Mine, mine's just a comment. It's Michelle from Hawkesbury. Um, some of you may be aware of um, Grace Carskin's research where um, she found a manuscript in the um, State Library with some a, a lot of um, Hawkesbury River names, which mm -hmm. was done... Um, uh, created in the 1820s but it just goes to show that sometimes we think you know nothing else is going to pop up but that type of research which has led to a lot of um, additional research for, for Aboriginal names but you know it, I never thought that they'd find something like that so it just shows that that some of these things are still hidden around and may come yeah. to light yeah hopefully yes yeah, yeah. All right. Can I ask just a general question? At our council here on the Northern Beaches, uh, the community keep writing in and asking for council to change names of streets. Um, we're not contacted. And then the next thing I hear, a street has been changed with nobody looking into the reason. A street got its history in the first place. I don't know if anyone else is having that same thing happening in their areas. I, I used to be consulted quite often on street names and, and also I can't hear you Jeff I'm oh, sorry I I used to be consulted quite often on street names but we've had a lot of changes in council but we've also had a lot of changes of personnel at council and I don't those sort of um, requests don't come across my desk very often at all now um and uh so yeah it's it's a bit unfortunate i think that's happened a lot with the change of staff 
that that's happened recently at Hawkesbury but um for some reason the staff member came to the library she didn't know what she was doing and had to research and I said well normally I've I've helped contribute to that so I think maybe contacting the people in council to make sure that could they just um you know that you're a resource and you can help them um can they run things by you just making them aware because often they're people that don't really have the knowledge themselves it's very true okay thanks jeff that was good thank you um okay uh kimberly won't be presenting today she had she was called away but we've got marilyn now talking on fairfield good morning Hi. <laughs> hey. um, I'll share my screen with everyone. Hmm. I've got too many screens open. <laughs> okay. Can anyone, everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, I do apologise uh, for coming no, in late. It's not the full uh, screen, though. You've got the other... Have not? Okay. I'll, I'll put it on um, just a moment. How about now? Yeah, perfect. Oh, excellent. Okay, yeah, my, my apologies coming in late. Um, today I'll be sharing with you a project that we undertook during COVID lockdown. And we decided to see if we can collect some, some uh, photographs from uh, people, what people are doing during lockdown. So this is what I've got up there is a flyer that we've created uh, to use for our um, um, promotion. So I'll go through the project um, with you um, bit by bit, then I'll take you to where we display the photos for everyone to see. So we called that the title of our project was Our Stories, Fairfield Daily Life During COVID-19. So um, this digital collection documents the stories and experiences of the Fairfield community during the COVID-19 pandemic that hit Australia early 2020 and is still part of everyday life. Um, even though we're coming out of it, but I think we're still impacted um, somehow by it. So COVID-19 has changed the way we live our daily life. We work from home and we learned from home. We wore masks and we're still wearing masks, I guess. Uh, keeping our distances, we found um, new ways to connect as businesses are closed and events were cancelled. We checked in and checked out, got tested and jabbed. We miss our families and smile at a screen which everyone relates to that, I guess. Um, so a lot of people got creative and some of them bored, some exercise to stay sane. So we, look, we looked after each other and all tried to, to do our best. So to share people's stories in, in that respect, um, we invited the community, the residents and people who worked in the Fairfield area to share images of how their daily lives have changed during the pandemic. Um, so we asked the community to take a photo, find an image that um, they have taken in the last year that captures their daily life during the, the pandemic. Um, and to complete a form, um, a, a, a form which we have uploaded on our um, library, um, uh, library site, uh, we uh, connected the, through the flyouts for people to connect through that. And if they had any questions, and we also asked the community to stay at home. We didn't encourage them to go out and take photos and get themselves in trouble during the lockdown. So, and also we mentioned we were very particular about copyright. So by, uh, at the end of it, we said by completing the form, you give Fearful Council permission to collect and share your images. And we had a media release, basically what I've said was um, sort of, um, included in that uh, media release and some of the frequently um, asked questions we covered because we thought you know people's going to say what am i what am i going to submit so we had a frequently asked um, questions uh, area and how to upload their images 
And we also said that we're going to have these photos available on our um, heritage website, which I'm taking you to. Can you see that? Can you see the site or not? Yes, we could. The website? Yeah, it's gone now, but it was yeah. there. Okay, I'll, I'll relink it. Yes, got Can it. You see it? Yeah. Yes. So this is our um, heritage website. On this site, we have all our collections. So it's our platform for for everything, for including um, photographs, um, our vintage village, which um, our collection as well, the um, object collection. We have newspapers, which is local history resources. Um, our social history exhibitions are also there, our object collection, our art collection, our military collection, and our oral histories. And also we've got council minutes on this. So what we included, an extra tile to cover our stories. And the idea of this was for people to actually see their, their uh, photographs published in sort of instantly online within a day, not instant, but within a day. So during, since August till now, we've collected over 100 photos. I mean, some of them were a bit silly, some of them were funny. Um, I'll just share a few, few of them. I really liked one where a lady actually made a cake for her husband's birthday. Um, and she's got stay at home with a mask and sanitizers. Um, so people did some funny stuff as well, but basically they were um, um, showing what the things they did during COVID. Just go back here. Um, I mean, if you have a chance, there's a link. I can share my presentation with everyone. There's a link there through our webs website. But also some people went and looked and took photos when they were shopping. Um, some people took photos where they were cycling. And we also added, when they submitted, they gave us um, a blurb about what it was. So we sort of um, just tidied that up and, and posted it on there, online. So this collection will stay there. I mean, it's, it's a way of documenting um, what we did during COVID in the Fairfield area. But um, what I found during this project, it went seamless because um, we had a communications uh, department on board and because we were all working from home, they were sort of um, very proactive in getting things done for us. We advertised heavily on our Facebook um, platform, the library and the council one. Um, uh, we boosted the ads twice. Um, but other than that, you know, entries were coming in uh, with no, no uh, problems. Um, what else was going to... Let me go back to my presentation. Um, I think that was all. Um, the marketing bit, um, I think social media played a big part in, our, in um, our advertising the event, but we also uh, printed some A5 flyers and distributed them with the, when council was distributing food to residents. So we also added some flyers there. But basically that's, that's all about our project. Are you going to continue a similar thing now? Um, what we're doing now is um, because this is we, we're keeping it open, but we haven't had any entries in the last couple of weeks since we've um, come back. Uh, we're going to leave it open a little bit more, but then we will take it down. But we're starting a new project uh, called the City Photographer, where we ac actually um, advertise for a photographer to come on board. And we had about 28 um, submissions and we chose someone to be this 20, 21 city photographer of Fairfield for the G. Um, so we're collecting photos through that project now, which there'll be more of professional, more staged and photographed for to document our history. 
on a particular theme or just whatever appealed to them? Well, this, no, we, we, um, we actually agreed on we're going to do a theme where the photographer will uh, follow three different um, uh, families or people from different demographics and follow their lifestyle, what they're doing, and photograph it as they go. So, for example, um, a young person will be chosen, um, a mother of with children, um, um, a multicultural person, an elderly person. So we're choosing different demographics and follow their what they do on a daily life, in their daily life, and document it in photographs. It's a great idea. Mm. And was it easy to find the people to photograph? Um, well, we're in the process of organising it because we just okay. came back from lockdown, so we couldn't do any of that. Yeah. Um, we're not short of um, ideas and, and because we've got a lot of networks yeah. um, here, um, I, I really can't see a problem um, getting people on board. Any other questions? Um, I was just going to comment that at Ride, we, we tried a similar thing in the first lockdown with uh, people being able to upload photographs and whatever and we had hardly any submissions. So most of the photos that, that we have of the area during lockdown was last year when I was able to go around and, and take things in, in shopping centres and whatever. But we had very little participation from members of the public. Yeah, we had the same experience, um, Angela, at, in Cumberland as well. We put out a call as well on social media during the lockdown last year. We had one response which we put out there <laughs> it was really great to see but nothing else came so I was reliant really on a lot of my fellow staff getting around who lived in the LGA to give me what photos they could um, and this time around because of the fact that we were one of the hotspot councils I'm actually now reached the point where I'm talking to councils media staff who were out there photographing um, you know the food hamper distributions and all the other community efforts that were going on by those staff who were still working here at the time so at least I've got that as a record so I'm hoping to get those pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Thank you, Jane. Any other questions? Yeah, that was good, Marilyn. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So next up is general business.